Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of conversations with spiritually awakening people. I've done nearly 600 of them now. If this is new to you and you would like to check out previous ones, please go to batgap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P, and look under the past interviews menu. This program is made possible through the support of appreciative listeners and viewers. So if you appreciate it and would like to help support it, there's a PayPal button on every page of the site. And there's also a page of alternatives for people who don't want to use PayPal. Uh, my guest today is Lisa Rose. Welcome, Lisa. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Um, Lisa would fall into the category of people who aren't teachers, who haven't written a book, who are not trying to be famous, um, <laughs> as far as I know, um, but who uh, have had a very profound spiritual awakening and a very interesting story to tell about it. And we like to interview those people whenever we can find them. Um, I'm going to just read a few little bits from the short bio that she sent me, but I want her to do most of the elaborating. So here's what I'll just read. Um, all I ever did was emphatically declare, I want to know God now. It wasn't long before I was fast-tracked into a reality I didn't know existed, an inner world full of extraordinary gifts and ultimately liberation of the mind. The regeneration occurred February 2016, followed by three full years of bliss, a state of consciousness I am convinced is that of a newborn. I wallowed in that cocoon, integrating the expansion that I sometimes felt might never end, until the desire emerged to step back out into the world. While monumentally profound in numerous aspects, I have always felt it to be, a pure, to, to be purely a transition that the best is yet to come. So <laughs> these are three, those are three little disjointed you know, snippets of, of what she sent me, but I, I would you know, much prefer that she fill in all the details than me read a big long thing. So, Lisa, where shall we start? Well, um, how about if I start by uh, uh, just communicating the experience, because that'll get the flow going, because okay. it was pretty exciting. <laughs> And then we'll um, we'll talk about some other aspects of you know how I arrived at the experience and what it's ha has occurred since. Yeah. Okay. Um, the uh, what has been called a, a spiritual awakening. I have a, another word for it. Rick mentioned it in in the bio. I use regeneration, a regeneration of my consciousness. Um, but it was referred to as a spiritual awakening after it occurred and I began uh, researching it and they, uh, the word Kundalini kept coming up and I researched Kundalini awakening. Um, so uh, it, 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 it occurred one evening after approximately three years of intense contemplation. I, I never knew anything about <clears throat> meditation. Um, or, or prayer. Um, I like, like Rick said, I was completely irrevocably done with human suffering. And I really wanted to know God. And I, and I stated that to somebody very specifically and, and emphatically. And um, I, I got a laptop and I wound up uh, uh, on a path that led me down uh, quantum theory and meditative science, mind science, meditative science, and I fixed upon a uh, a, a pamphlet written back in the early 1900s called Mind's Silent Partner by Dr. James Porter Mills, and in there was a formula to regenerate one's consciousness from the normal human race consciousness to divine consciousness. And we do that through the I am statement of being and contemplating our omniscient, infinite, and eternal nature. So a little bit about what I was doing that led up to the experience, um, having no idea about a spiritual community or spiritual awakening or anything. Um, 
So one, uh, one evening as I sat down to uh, contemplate, actually study, uh, I happened to be almost uh, taking a course of Ramana Maharshi's teachings. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that in, in just a few minutes, but sat down to, uh, sat down to study looked at a, a picture of, of Ramana Maharshi, just kind of like this off the book that I was uh, uh, studying. And um, because I was having some difficulty physiologically with a lot of pressure in my system, a uh, lot, of, lot of energy that was rising up in my system, I was in a uh, a state myself of, of, of suffering, right? And I looked at him and I questioned to myself, Ramana, how, you know, because he, we were studying his life history and, and, and at this point in time, we were only day eight into the course and I was learning about him as a young man, right? And learned that he was, um, uh, had had some sort of experience and ran off to the mountains and and he wasn't taking care of his body. People had to take care of him. And the first thing I, I thought of was, how could you possibly do this to your beautiful young body? I'm suffering. How is it you can you possibly just lay in the gutters was the way it was uh, written, you know, and have people take care of you. And Rick, I honestly threw the book across the bed. <laughs> In total disgust, uh -huh. I was, and I'm wondering to myself, why am I studying this material? Um, you know, I'll get back to my James Porter Mills uh, meditations, right, to wedding house. So I tossed the book across the bed. I, I had opened up a bottle of beer because I just finished a two-hour conversation with some people that I was speaking the whole time. Took a swig of the beer, set the beer down, and this is when the experience occurred. So I have my, uh, I'm, I'm sitting up on the bed, my legs are stretched out, and suddenly a flash sensation uh, came over my entire body instantly as I describe it to people, as if every particle of my body stood at attention as if meeting its maker. It was, a, it was an incredible sensation. But in the very next moment, my eyes clamped shut, not of my own volition. I did not clamp my eyes shut. Um, and they stayed shut through the entire experience, clamped, right? Uh, then something slid back in the middle of my head, which was an incredibly euphoric uh, uh, sensation, incredibly euphoric. And then this energy, this pressure that had been building up, this rising energy due to my three years of contemplation, started to gush through the crown of my forehead, or excuse me, the crown of my head like a, like a fire hose is the way I describe it. Uh, very, very powerful. Um, you, I, can, I liken it sometimes to if you're riding in, in the backseat of a vehicle and somebody up, you know, rolls down their window, you know, that, that intense wind like fluttering kind of that, thing yeah yeah that yeah that fluttering sensation but anyhow it's, it's uh this energy is gushing through the uh, crown of my head at that power and i knew something of course by this time that uh it w was very profound happening happening to me all i could think of was how great it was because the pressure had been building up so so much um a, a few moments into things and just a few moments into things, remember my eyes are clamped shut, a holographic image of Ramana Maharshi appeared behind, I say my eyes were closed, but it first appeared right here in the middle of my forehead, a holographic image of Ramana, um, this, this image of him, just the bus. Can't quite see that, see but that? yeah, okay, just, the, just, yeah, just, just his the head. Just the bus, yeah. yes, just the head. Uh, a very familiar picture of him. So, and it's a holographic image, black and white. And, uh, and he says in a, it was kind of a metallic uh, voice uh, 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 with an Indian accent. It was a male voice, Indian accent, a little metallic, higher in tone than I, than I would have expected. Um, but he said, um, feel good. <laughs> and, 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 and not having, you know, I'm, I'm inside, I'm shaking my head. I'm not shaking my head, but inside I'm agreeing. And he says, enjoy. 
and the image starts to fade. And I said, don't go. Of course, I'm not saying this. It was right in that moment that I realized I'm speaking telepathically. It was in my mind that I was speaking this, don't go. The next thing I knew, the image, of course, my eyes are clamped shut, appeared again behind just my left eye. And there's some significance to that. Um, later, I'll talk to uh, a little bit about that, but the image, and, and, and this time it's not, no longer a full body image. He's uh, laying, um, you've seen pictures of him on the chassis in the ashram. Lying down, kind of like, yeah. Yeah, with, yeah, yeah kind of like yeah. that, but he wasn't like that. His legs, his arms were at his side, and he's looking at me, and he says, however long you stay is all that I am. And I literally was floored because that is a song phrase uh, a phrase of a song that that I would sing at the top of my lungs, uh, maybe a decade earlier, uh, from a song by a group called the Sick Puppies, called "All the Same." And if you, know, you go back and look at those those words, they they obviously uh, have a lot of a lot of meaning. But however long you stay is all that I am. And I, of course, am, am still in bewilderment at, at, at what is happening. The energy is still gushing out of my head. And um, there were several things that, that were said that, you know, just communicating back and forth um, telepathically, which was really cool, uh, at one point in time. And I won't go into detail because it, a lot of it doesn't, is not that's significant, except for a couple of things. When there was one time when I asked a question telepathically, and when I looked at him, sometimes I would switch my my vision or my attention to my right eye, okay? And, and I couldn't see him in my left eye. So I'm looking at him, I ask him a question, and the image, his head had turned away. And I knew that the the question that I asked was one that he wasn't going to answer at all. And I turned and looked into my right eye thinking what I must have, you know, I, I, I must have done the most spiritually, the biggest faux pas <laughs> ever, asking Ramana Maharshi a, 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 such a question. I didn't know what what to do, what to say. I was kind of embarrassed, right? And, and um then he th then then something comes out of my mouth but i did not i did not think this thought rick it was as if he was compassionate enough with me there was a thought that was put into my head that then i asked the next question to him it was really kind of interesting because i'm over here in total embarrassment and the next thing i know i'm asking him a question that 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 was put into my head. That was really cool. I thought that was really cool. Uh, several other things happened. Um, uh, one um, was I'm, I'm, I'm sitting there and again, energy still gushing out of the middle of my head. And 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 uh, uh, I, I get an itch on the, the outside of my left eyelid that wouldn't go away. And um, it's, you know, it's I'm, I'm looking at him. I'm staring at him. He's got this grin on his face and he looks at me and says, itch it. Because I'm thinking if I itch it, right, it, all this is going to, the whole thing is going to blow up and, and it's going to go away. So I was doing my best, but he knew, he knew what was going on and he said, itch it. So I itched it. I was surprised really that I could lift my hand up. My arms had been at my side and my body. I couldn't even feel my body, right? I'm still in my body, by the way, all this time. Okay, I, I never left my body. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and so I itch it and he's still there. We continued on a little bit further in the communication until it, it suddenly he decided it was time to go. He said, time for you to contemplate now, which was really interesting. He uses the word contemplate right? Knowing I've never meditated a day in my life. I knew nothing about meditation. I was contemplating all those three years, right? And, and, uh, and, and as he's parting and he's fading, 
and he's kind of walking into me. So I can feel my head looking, you know, kind of <laughs> into myself, right? And he's walking and he says, and he says, hold on, stay inside. And that too is a, another phrase from a song that I would sing at the top of my lungs for over a decade, two and three times a day. I just loved it. Believe it or not, it's a heavy metal song <laughs> by a, and I'm not really a heavy metal person, but I love this song by the, a band called Tool. Uh, called Parabola, and it speaks to a very spiritual uh, happening where the spirit of of life is rising up through the, the the songwriter. So Ramana is giving me this song phrase: "Hold on, stay inside." And uh, so that was that was that was pretty incredible. And then and then the image completely faded, and and I uh, I was I was left to enjoy the the remainder of the experience. And and when all the energy stopped uh, gushing out of the top of my head, my eyes uh, came open very naturally. Everything was fine, and I and I grabbed a, a notebook and and I and I and I wrote everything down best as I could remember. So. Uh, I didn't do my homework that night, <laughs> my Ramana Maharshi homework, but um, it, it was uh, it was it was quite profound. It lasted maybe 10, 12 minutes, I guess. The beer was still cold that I had set over on the side of the bed, uh, and so wildly extraordinary, out of the ordinary. I, I think it probably took almost a month, Rick, of me just thinking about it, remembering it, rereading my notes to, you know, try to grasp any, any significance of it uh, at all. So uh, gorgeous experience. The immediately afterwards, there weren't any uh, physiological changes. Nothing uh, occurred that was out of the ordinary, like, seeing unicorns or, <laughs> you know, psychic abilities or nothing of that nature. I, my, nothing, nothing really changed the, uh, the, um, in fact, it took almost three or four months before all that pressure that I was feeling in my upper body, right. Began to, began to dissipate. And, um, so, uh, but not to say that my life hasn't totally changed and there's been a lot that's happened since, but I, that, that gets, that gets me going. It gets me in that state, that flow to, to share. So thank you for letting me. Great. Yeah. I will unpack all that. And, uh, yeah. while we're on this note, uh, a question came in from Rahul in India. Um, he said, you know, Lisa said she was in bliss for three years after this 2016. She mentions Kundalini. Has she been able to work at will with her kundalini or does she struggle with the energy i was struggling with the energy um throughout the three years of contemplation and probably after i had spoken with uh bonnie greenwell oh, yeah. psychotherapist mm -hmm. uh, kundalini expert uh and of course uh, I didn't speak to Bonnie until after the full three years of bliss. I pretty much took Ramana's suggestion to hold on and stay inside, meaning don't go out the way I interpreted it. Don't go outside of yourself to try to find out what happened to you. And there was a good reason for that because I, I wasn't experiencing the bliss right away. It actually came very gradually, right? We'll talk about that in a minute. But to answer Raul's question, three years afterwards, when I felt like I was done, <laughs> ready, uh, I contacted Bonnie Greenwell to begin to understand uh, what is Kundalini, this beautiful life energy is what I call it. And in talking through some things with her, we went back through some of my uh, earlier years from about age 20, 30, and 40, and uh, realized that perhaps I'd been having uh, the, the kundalini symptoms uh, all those years, but not knowing what they, not knowing what they were. Uh, uh, heart palpitations, we'll speak about that in just a little bit. Uh, uh, sensations, tingling sensations throughout my body. Uh, so, to answer his question, I uh, because I didn't know physiologically what was happening to me, I had no orientation at all to Hinduism or the, the life energy. Um, 
I, um, I, I, I simply kept after it. One of the most interesting things along the way, the three years of contemplation, was that as the, the more I contemplated, and what I contemplated on was our uh, omniscient and infinite and eternal nature. And along with that came this sense of knowing, knowing, they call it the gnosis, the sense of knowing that everything was going to be okay, that that all of this is happening for a reason. And of course, what else was I going to do but to continue to? And this is where I had uh, learned uh, about the what I call the art of surrender through R Ramana Maharshi. Very briefly, I'd I'd heard I'd heard about the surrender, and I and I just latched onto that word and learned to in every single moment especially since a lot of this was happening to me physically, right, to just surrender into it. I'm not going to the doctors, okay? I'm not taking any special medication for any of this. Um, I'm, I'm working through because it was, it kept building up. So it started from the top of my head, worked downward in through my temples, into my jaw. I knew something was happening. Again, it's a, it's a knowing, an art of surrender, and it's coming from this... Oh, beautiful life energy that is moving through me and it's giving me the confidence, uh, the faith, right, to continue to pursue uh, my spiritual practice at, at all costs. So, yeah, thanks for the question. Sure. Here's another one that came in, a Kundalini related one from probably he, he or she pronounces it Jean from France. Um, could Lisa shed, shed some light on how to approach or nourish the kundalini process so it unfolds harmoniously and leads to realization or awakening? For me, it's been evolving in phases, intense kriyas, kriyas are you know, body motions that sometimes are caused by kundalini. Yeah, yeah. I'm just telling for the audience. Then uh, harmonious mudras, mudras are these like, you know, various hand symbols and stuff that might be made um, some soma dropping, which maybe you can explain if our um, energy intensifying yet running smoother, like my vessel is cleaner. Meditation deepens from one day to another, but existential pain is intense. <laughs> That's the question. Oh boy, because I didn't know about Kundalini or life energy, or auras, or what do we call, um, biofields. I, I knew nothing about energy. I knew nothing about energy and what was happening to me. So uh, all I knew was to surrender to it. And I think Bonnie Greenwell would better be able to explain and answer that question. She's worked with two, two to 3,000 people who have had all kinds of uh, Kundalini-related uh, uh, symptoms, right? Um, I, I had a couple of them that, that the, the, this questioner has, has asked, but I only knew surrender, meaning, and I can't even say that I knew to relax into it. There's no relaxing into it sometimes other than I did, I did hike a lot. I did hike a lot to, to help to release that energy. And it always made me, it always made me feel better, but I was always back to my contemplative practice so that by the end of the evening, my head is, you know, still kind of, kind of, uh, you know, full of that beautiful energy. I, um, one of the things I'd like to talk about a, a little bit later on is uh, the lore and the mysticism, I think, that's associated with this energy uh, that perhaps would make it easier for uh, some, some people to uh, approach it full-heartedly and to um, embrace it and to surrender to it. it, it yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, let me just uh, mention that I've interviewed Bonnie Greenwell twice. You can find her in the um, past interviews menus on BatGap. And also Joan Shivarpita Harrigan, who's a really great Kundalini expert, and uh, Danny Antman, and a bunch of others. There's a categorical index, and, and there's a Kundalini category. And if you look at that, you'll see all the people I've um, interviewed that 
talk specifically about that. Lawrence Edwards was another one. Um, so anyway, there's a lot to be found there. And there, there's also some great books. Bonnie has written a book or two. Um, Joan Harrigan has written a very comprehensive book about Kundalini, which goes into it in great, great detail. So if a person wants to learn you know, more about it, just in terms of their understanding, um, those are some good resources. Yeah, yeah, Bonnie was uh, very helpful in, in, you know, when I, again, after the three years of bliss, right, I'm look, I was looking back, I'm like, huh, you know, <laughs> uh, I, I, I had, I had no, I, I had no idea. And of course, some of the, uh, not just physical, but psychological manifestations uh, of, of the Kundalini energy. And again, uh, even according to Bonnie, I mean, on Bonnie's website, the, 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 she has the word surrender right there, right there on, on, on the, on the, on the front page of her website, because, uh, it is a, well, it's your higher self. It is your, it is your, uh, life energy that's trying to break through blockages our conditionings, right. That we have subjected ourselves to since we were children and, um, sometimes unknowingly, sometimes knowingly. And, um, it's really just your, your, yourself, your higher self that's here right with us at all times, trying to break through those blockages. So it's not here to frighten you. It's not here to, uh, hold you back, uh, or, or make anything more difficult for you. It might seem so in the time at the time it's happening, trust me, but it will break through. It will find a way to break through if you're fully surrendered. Yeah. It's a very, very loving, very intelligent energy, life energy. Yeah. It can be frightening. Of course, if a person has no idea what it is and they start having these symptoms like you, I mean, 20 yes, years yes. going to doctors, taking pills, <laughs> yes, this and that. Yes. Lots, lots of pills. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And it could even yeah. be more intense than that. I mean, sometimes people, well, mm -hmm. if you read Gopi Krishna's book and, you know, the hell that he went through for a long time. So, yeah. you know, it depends on a lot of things. I imagine a lot of variables such as the intensity of the flow and the solidity of the blockages and a number of and mm -hmm. there's if you get into joan harrigan's work there's all sorts of different routes that the kundalini can take and sometimes it can get off on a tangent and get get sort of stuck in a deflected rising as they call it uh, so it's a whole science and there's a lot to, to know about it well let's talk about the uh, three years of bliss yeah that sounds because refreshing after, yeah after all the <laughs> Uh, well, after the gorgeous experience, I really kind of uh, uh, wasn't what didn't know what to expect. Although I, I did pay attention and and stay with it. So the three years of bliss and, commenced right after this Ramana Maharshi on the yeah, bed with the beer. Well, I kind of, I kind of, yeah, uh -huh. it it it, uh, it surfaced. Rick, honestly, I didn't recognize it uh, until probably about six months into it. Um, I happened to be at a spiritual retreat. I thought, oh, there's a spiritual community out there. I had no idea, right? <laughs> I, I, I went to a spiritual retreat. Regina Don Akers was awakening together. Who's been on Backgap, uh, yep. Yes, who has been on Backgap. And uh, we had, uh, we had uh, a, an exercise where we were to uh, close our eyes and uh, manifest anger within us, right? Or some negative human emotion. And I closed my eyes and I, for the life of me, I couldn't, I couldn't generate an, uh, you know, a negative human emotion at all. Right. And, I, and that was the first time I recognized, I'm like, you know, I, I don't have any negative human emotions at all. And that was six months. And I kept riding that wave actually for 18 months. So it wasn't just negative human emotion that, uh, that I was no longer experiencing. It was even some positive human emotion, things like, uh, you know, joy and laughter and things like that. They were all kind of still there, but what I was trying to explain is that this this bliss, this bliss kind of trumps all human emotion. I call it uh, uh, original human emotion, uh, original consciousness. It, it it it's as if I was a I were a a newborn, and you know how a a, a child maybe by about the age of six months old, 
starts to, you know, the face opens up, uh, the eyes open up and is smiling and giggling. And, you know, uh, by the time he's 18 months old, he's just, just running around. It's just a happy thing. And, and there were some things like, um, I would be able to, um, uh, stand at the edge of a hundred foot cliff and you know how, and you know, you know how does you look down and you're like, oh my God, you know, just don't stay away from that. No, I was, whoa, you know, I could, I could honestly dive into that cliff just like a little 18 month old child would just, you know, just, just plunge off of a cliff. Uh, certain things like that, sensations of fear or uh, uh, animosities or things like that that you were trying to stay away from. I didn't have those sensations and I found it to be the most extraordinary thing ever. I, I thought, I, you know, everything would just slide off me like Teflon, right? Um, and and it, it, so it rose up ever so gently, and I call it a bell curve. And after about 18 months, right, then just as gently as the bliss surfaced, uh, it, it fell away in, an, in exactly another 18 months. So three full years of bliss. And, uh, and as it was falling away, don't think for a moment I wasn't <laughs> saddened. It's the first time I felt a negative human emotion was a little bit of sadness that the bliss was falling away. And as it continued to fall away, you're like, where's, where's my bliss? <laughs> um, and I, the negative human emotions have, have never returned, never returned. And this was happening between 2016, 17 and 18. Um, I could be faced with a negative uh, situation like what we're all going through right now, right? And, you know, I, I just see it entirely differently now. The only the only emotion that I ever feel anymore sometimes is is some frustration, some frustration at, at some things. But um, a, a, as as the bliss was falling away, and I'm wondering why it's falling away, I realize that it's because during during those three during that period let's say i'm up to about 24 months in bliss i realize i have no desires whatsoever none i we sold the house closed down the businesses my husband was ready to to retire anyway we've been married 40 years and had been operating a home building business for about 15 years together right and um moved sold the house moved to colorado uh, took up fly fishing. Uh, I didn't have a care in the world. I didn't have a desire to uh, even sp speak out or, I mean, things were still working through me. I was not done yet. I was still in the oven, right? I was still, I was still baking this whole process. They call it integrating, integrating the process. And, and, and now I see why. I mean, had you spoke to me at, directly after the experience, I would have said, yeah, well, I had this experience, big deal, right? But or at how about at the peak of the bliss? I, I would have I would have sounded like a, a bliss ninny. I, I I seriously there was there was total detachment from the world, total detachment. And um, so I, I can see how in the days of let's say Ramana Maharshi or or Bindo, that that era where we just run to the mountains. We, we, we create ashram around us because we uh, can barely, I say, barely, barely take care of ourselves. Thank God for my husband. I call him my ashram because if it weren't for him, right, uh, uh, I, I, I would have, I, I, I just needed him, we, especially here in the West in the United States. You know, things became very, very difficult. Things I didn't want to do like uh, go, go shopping anymore. I didn't care about cooking anymore. It just it just falls away. You're just in bliss. So um, beautiful, beautiful uh, period of bliss. And it fell away. And as it was falling away, I began to realize, and this is part of the wisdom of this beautiful life energy that continues to uh, rise up into your consciousness, right? That tells you that there's a reason why the bliss is subsiding. And there's a reason and a purpose and here I am right now to speak to everybody about it. If the bliss did not go away, I wouldn't be here speaking about it and being able to share with all the world. Yeah. So. I have a few thoughts on all this. Um, first, a question, what does your husband think about all this? 
Well, um, it wasn't until after the bliss that I uh, that I that I spoke to him about it, and uh, uh, of course, you know, deer in the headlights, right? Um, and so we we choose the the moments carefully and 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 the circumstances. Didn't you think something weird and, was going on with you? If you, you know, you just no, no, okay, no, not really. I think you know he. I was already had been spending a lot of time by my by myself in in uh, in contemplation. Um, you know, I I stopped a lot of uh, group outings that, that we were doing group, big group events. Uh, we lived on a golf course community and I stopped doing large, uh, you know, uh, tournaments, um, uh, stopped doing boating, boating activity. I ended up kayaking a lot by myself, hiking a lot by myself. So, you know, it was fairly gradual shifts in my behavior, but nothing really out of the ordinary. I didn't watch TV much to begin with anyway. But from that point forward, since I took up contemplation, there was no TV. I haven't watched TV in probably a decade. So other than golf, I, I love golf. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but um, yeah, it's uh, uh, he's been again uh, ashram without even knowing it. Uh, the the you know we've had such a good relationship uh, since we no children. Uh, we've had a very very good relationship. Worked together for 15 years. Um, it was kind of interesting that um, the uh, uh, probably about, and, and again, I would choose my moments, Rick, uh, choose the circumstances and find that right moment to say a little bit about something, right? And when I hit that point where I was telling him about Ramana Maharshi coming into <laughs> Yeah, it is like, okay, so uh, that might have been a little, little, little too premature. But uh, uh, it was only last summer. So, uh, you know, probably a good going on four and a half years after after the experience that we're having dinner across uh, from each other uh, at, the, at the dinner table. And I was trying to open up again about the experience and he set his fork down and he looks at me and he has a, a glazed look in his eyes. And well, it wasn't it's not it was what it was because he says, Lisa. I honestly do not have any idea what you're talking about. <laughs> and he's, it, was a, it was a very heartfelt, he wants so much to understand, right? And it, you know, it was in that moment that I realized, oh my gosh, even in these two years that, you know, because people who've, if we've never uh, thought about God or spirit in terms of consciousness, or the principle of our being, okay. Uh, first cause, a lot of a lot of terminology that I was using that I really didn't realize uh, that you know there there's a huge segment of the population, at least here in the West, who've never even considered relating God, our Creator, to consciousness, and that's when I realized I'm like, okay, all right, Tim, would it help if I write a paper? Yes, please. And I said, Tim, by the way, I've recently found some science behind uh, th the bliss that I told you about. Can I include that? He said, oh, please, anything, anything, if you can put it in writing that maybe I can grasp this a lot better and we can talk about it, you know, at a level that that uh, that I can understand. So that's what I did, Rick. And that is actually the paper that I wrote to you. It was out of inspiration to uh, my lifelong partner who wasn't understanding a word that I said. And I well, if he can't understand what I'm saying, then I need to put it in writing. Because a lot of it is has a, has a, a very uh, uh, science orientation, uh, basic fundamental science. So um, it's, it's good now. He's read the paper. And he's opened up to a lot of uh, concepts uh, like consciousness and higher self and is actually uh, starting to work on uh, meditative practice of his own. So there we go. Cool. Yeah, I read, I <laughs> yeah. reread one just this morning called From Existence to Life. Is that the one that you're referring to? It's like 12 pages long. Uh, yes, that's my paper. Okay, yes. good. Uh -huh. If you want, I can actually link to it on the website and people can read it if they okay. want to get into more details. Well, yeah, the one thing about that is um, if you put a warning on it, <laughs> 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 the, 
because the people uh, other than you, okay, and some of the science people that I've sent it to, science foundations, um, it is not a truth teaching. People expect that whatever comes out of me is going to be nothing but truth teaching. And I've not gotten to that point. Yeah. Uh, it, is, it is a description of the experience. I've tried to put it in layman's terms. I, I specifically uh, 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 put it uh, in the context of a, uh, the step-by-step the -step process. This is what I did. Yeah, no, it was and, a good account. It went step-by-step, -step, yeah. as you say. And uh, I'll put it up there because and, and, um, it might get into some stuff that we hadn't Talk, that we don't talk about today, and um, you know, people enjoy reading it. They haven't published a book, so they might as well read that. Plus, at the end, there's yeah, some yeah. science stuff that we probably won't get into in such yeah, detail. Yeah. Well, I don't know, but let me let me just the reason why I sent it to you. Okay, I went to uh, the Backcap site, which is just gorgeous, Rick. It's it just gorgeous. I, I, I that's how where I found found Bonnie Greenwell, and I love a lot of the interviews there. And I typed in the word. Yeah, I forget what it was, consciousness or something. By the way, I came upon uh, John Hagelin's interview that you had, right? <laughs> Gorgeous. I thought about sending him my paper as well. But um, the reason why I sent you the paper, I'd come across Dean Radin's most recent interview with you. And at the very end of the two hours, if I may quote, because it's, it, it was, I was sure. inspired to send you the paper. Yeah. He says, the reason why you would do science in the domain of consciousness is to figure out who and what we are and to test whether the idea that we live in a nihilistic universe is correct. Yeah, I think so, that's really a fundamental and extremely yeah, important but thing. Yep, yeah, but he says, so if there's any evidence that we're not living in a random universe that's completely pointless, pointless and you can get there rationally without having to dive into religion, that would help everyone. Yeah. Great. So that's what my paper is about. It's it's uh, there was there's no religion whatsoever in in my practices and in, in what I was doing. There was religion in my consciousness still, Christian religion in my consciousness, but my practice that I was pursuing was one of regenerating my consciousness from a human race consciousness to divine consciousness. So I have the step-by-step -step procedure right there in the paper. And hopefully if it doesn't, if it only just helps one person, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. And yeah, yeah, maybe we can prove it in the lab. I don't think we're putting <laughs> down religion here. Religion, religion oh, no. has a lot of cool stuff in it, but it seems to be sorely lacking in experience. And if you just have the sort of all the trappings of religion without the experience that inspired the religion in the first place, it's yeah. kind of like, I don't know, it's kind of empty. It's like a dead body that lost its spirit or something. Um, it, it's, it's good. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, you know, it's what you bring to it. Right. But I never brought anything to it. I, I, I never, never engaged in, in a religious practice whatsoever. Yeah. Prayer, meditation. Yeah. Right. Amazing. You could have hung out in Texas so long. <laughs> 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 yeah, he must have been the local pariah. Uh, oh boy, uh, just a golf. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. What well, before we get too far from your bliss experience, one conjecture I had as you were describing it was um, that you know, like let's just use it a, a metaphor. If if a person's a multimillionaire, let's say Jeff Bezos or something like that, then you know he could gain a hundred bucks here, lose a hundred bucks there, and he wouldn't even notice it. Uh, he's still gaining and losing the hundred bucks, but they're just, it's just so completely over eclipsed by his wealth that it doesn't notice it. But if a person is like homeless and on welfare and all gaining or losing a hundred bucks would be a really big deal. You know, it would sort of rock yeah. his world one way or the other. So I think that we could maybe say that with regard to, you know, this upwelling of bliss and this fullness you were experiencing, you know, well, firstly, I think that the, well, maybe you, you can even complete my thought, but the we, the ups and downs of life just don't rock us that much because the fullness is so great by comparison with the gain, the little joys or sorrows, which may not even be little, but by comparison with the bliss, they are. And so there's an equanimity. You know, equanimity is a big word in spiritual development, but it's not something that you try to do it's something that happens when the fullness is is 
genuine and, and well enough established. Yeah. Um, let's let's that's it's a good it's a good good place to to talk about um, what was actually happening from a physiological uh, standpoint. And I've done some research. So after the bliss, I, uh, after the three year bliss period, gorgeous, um, you know, I decided to, to step out and research Kundalini. I talked to Bonnie, uh, that seemed to be appropriate. There was a lot of information out there. Uh, but you know, uh, and, and I, and I, and I hooked up with, uh, emerging sciences foundation. Yes, I am on, I'm on their uh, mailing list. Okay. Okay, Emerging Sciences Foundation, uh, read some of Gopi Krishna's uh, uh, works. But, you know, uh, that was all through 2019. So early 2020, when we were all having to go sit in our homes. Um, Hunker in our bunkers. I, uh, <laughs> Hunker in our bunkers. I, you know, I, I sat with this, the whole Kundalini awakening thing that everybody was saying that I had had. And I thought, you know, I set out to regenerate my consciousness. So what, whatever the world is calling it, you know, I'm looking at it as consciousness regeneration. And I'm going to emphasize that a number of, a, a number of times It's kind of important. So a, as I began to, and, and, and uh, be, began to uh, research and by research, Rick, by this time, the wisdom that is coming through you, you, you put a call out to the universe and things just the very next day, you know, things would show up on the internet, mm. right? You know how it is. Oh, yeah. It's just, it, it was just, it was phenomenal. And the pace then, the development along the way of my understanding of what had actually happened to me physiologically, um, uh, started to unfold very, very quickly. And one of the first things that I heard was uh, a, oh, I guess there was a week long seminar uh, by Unify the World. And uh, yeah, there were just like 15, it was, it's kind of like the Shift Network or something like that, um, uh, where they had some 50 presenters. And so I tuned into it, a lot of it in the background uh, until, I don't know, I happened to be lifting weights or something <laughs> like that. And in the background was, was, uh, was uh, this, this, this gentleman with white hair and, and white beard and mustache, a, a very older gentleman. And he began speaking about the importance of the peak bliss experience. And I'm like, what you know so i tune in at, and i'm and and he's going on about the physics of bliss the physics of kundalini he's he's actually saying these words the physics of bliss right and the importance of compassion and uh uh intention it, all these things that that i experience that led up to uh, what uh, it led up to the, 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 the regeneration, I'll call it, right? And as I studied, his name is Dan Winter, and as I studied Dan Winter's um, physics, which, look, I've only ever had uh, high school biology and, and chemistry, right? And that was some a few decades ago, several decades ago. So <laughs> when it came to trying to study physics, I did have to engage uh, a young man from Hawaii. Thank you, Jason, for helping me to to unpack a lot of the physics within a relatively short period of time. But bottom line, I'll make it really simple, if I may, because I think a lot of this will come circle back around bringing, I think, some practical foundation to what we're calling this kundalini a life energy and there's a lot of mystery around it okay but if i could just explain what was happening and it's a page taken from can we see this yes and uh we can see that and i am also going to put that i mean i'm going to link to that document you sent me and that also can that document it, contains it, that right. graphic so people will be able yeah, to see like it better page. yeah yeah, yeah. But if I can, I'll just put it over to the side here. Okay. So in general, we're a lot, a lot of us are living in fear and we have a, uh, a, a plasma, a light plasma body. So it's termed sometimes the biofield, it's ter termed sometimes aura, but it's a, uh, a, a conscious light 
body that surrounds our physical body. And when we're living in fear, right, it's uh, definitely contracted. And we all know, I think, by now what it means to be living in fear, these lower levels of consciousness that generate negative human emotion, uh, warring at each other, killing each other, right? It's just, it's just uh, a very contracted way of 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 living and working uh, with with our, with our with our energy, and I didn't know any of this. I was definitely living in fear for um, 55 years of my life, right? But then what I learned uh, when I stated my intention to know God, I was done with human suffering, my own in particular, right? But others. Uh, there were many, many things happening to my fam family and friends in particular around this gorgeous lake I lived on that in the past, Rick, I would probably just say, well, that's life. You know, that's the ups and downs of life that we all have our problems. Right. But I began to look at the the situations that my my uh, my family and friends were were experiencing. And I began to bring the compassion for what was happening into my heart, okay, into my heart. And I did start to feel some real love for my brethren. And then somewhere along the way, somebody passes me, and this is the first time I had met uh, this Regina. Oh, yes. Right, Regina Dunacres, mm -hmm. her, yeah, the, uh, the, the Holy Spirit's interpretation of the New Testament after only a uh, three-month contemplation of that beautiful writing, my energy right, had expanded. I began to know and identify. Identification with something other than your small self really helps to prompt right, some new beginnings and some, some expansion in your consciousness. Remember, your consciousness is not just what you feel is in your mind, right? What we, we experience consciousness, but it's actually a lot of this, uh, this these, the auric, the Taurus, right? Going on around you, right? And you're, you're expanding your consciousness. And you, I'm beginning to know myself as through, through the Regina's teaching as divine love. And divine peace, divine peace is actually, there is even physics. Dan Winters has written up physics as to what is happening in the heart when we bring in compassion and we find peace in our hearts for everything that is going on around us, no matter if there are wildfires going on or um, earthquakes or, you know, presidential elections. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> stuff like that. <laughs> but the peace, the peace in your heart becomes like that, that Teflon I spoke about, right? And as I continued to contemplate for about three months, uh, my, and see myself, identify myself as I am divine peace. I am divine love. We start to generate the uh, heart brain coherence. So the heart has opened up, right? And the 20 years of heart palpitation that I had been experiencing because I was over here in fear, I would say within within two or three days after about the three months. But I've, I was finally feeling like, hey, this heart palpitation that I had every single day for 20 years are gone. Gone. Threw out my meds, ripped up my appointment card with the cardiologist, and that was eight years ago. So seven, whatever. But you can see why the importance of the Heart Math Institute, right, has there's such an emphasis on the heart brain coherence. And if we're in fear, we'll never perhaps get to a point where we have this heart brain coherence. Each of us have a choice to do this individually, right? But as a human race, unless we can all find the peace in our hearts, right? Will we ever arrive at a place where we have the heart brain coherence, which then once we get to heart brain coherence, we can get to what we call the universal cosmic 
coherence. I began to, so after I took up Regina's teaching, learned myself as the peace and love of God, then I took up the mind's silent partner, mind silent partner, the, the, the pamphlet that was written in the early 1900s by the Dr. James Porter Mills, right? And in there, so Regina's teaching divine peace and love of God. He's talking about our omniscience and infinite and eternal nature. So as the, as I'm contemplating my infinite and eternal nature, these larger, more cosmic waves, the wave mechanics, quantum wave mechanics are entering into my aura, okay? And they're rising up. Notice, notice the concentration of energy in my head or in, 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 you know, in this picture. It, it's true. My head felt like it was about ready to explode. I, it was, it was, whereas it was stuck here in the heart chakra area, it was definitely stuck here in the seventh chakra area, right? But as I continued, again, these waves are conscious waves, and they are, it's conscious light that's entering into your auric field, and they are highly intelligent, highly knowing. They're all knowing waves. This is the, um, what we call the faith that comes into you, that gives you the confidence, no matter how you're feeling, right? Gives you the confidence to continue your practice, right? No matter what is going on. And so eventually, that's what happened that evening when I sat down on the bed, right? Eventually, and I tossed Ramana's book across the, <laughs> the room. Eventually, eventually, it's going to implode is actually the physics term right the physics terms for what had happened to me physiologically there's a lot more physics and i explain it a bit in the paper not too much just enough for you know us laymen a citizen scientist to be able to explain what is happening during what is termed a kundalini awakening a spiritual awakening with all this energy it's really quite simple I didn't know any of this. I was at the state of fear. All I knew was to surrender. And all this was happening. And the universe, I say the universe, right, is bringing to me all the books. You know, somebody passed me Regina's uh, New Testament interpretation, A Way of Mastery Woman. She's about 85 years old. I, she, said, she said, hey, what's happening to you? I <laughs> I said, I'd love to read the Bible, but I can't understand it. She says, here, have this. Boom. Within three months, you know, I go from, I go from fear to love because somebody passed me a book and I, I was open and receptive to reading that. Right. So, and I'll have to give thanks to the boys like uh, Braden, Greg Braden and, and Bruce Lipton for helping to open my mind and uh, uh, to, to, to consider to update my science and look at quantum theory and what is really going on when we speak at uh, our physical world in terms of you know the quantum the quantum mechanics the quantum wave uh, mechanics uh, because that really helps to loosen the mind from these physical objects and especially our bodies when we know that we're 99.9 percent .9 not physical matter then what is that what what is all that what is all that beautiful, gorgeousness stuff, right? That is right here, right here at our disposal for our use for our own, in my case, regeneration, right? And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second, because regeneration is a little bit more than just having this, phys uh, this spiritual experience. But for um, uh, the... Um, can, our, our actual health and well-being. It boils down to once your energy is cleared, once you've identified yourself, not only with the divine peace and love that we are, you identify yourself with as a divine creature, right? That is can be fully aware 
it grows. It's, it's, it, consciousness is kind of an evolution. If it came into my body all at once, I'd probably blow up, <laughs> right? But, Good point. But, but you become, a, yeah, you come up, become aware of your omniscient, infinite, and eternal nature, and those things that are associated with our omnipresence, right? The omnipresence of consciousness. And uh, that's, that's a whole other issue. You've probably, uh, you know, uh, talked about what 10 or 12 people, I guess, interviewed people just on the, the science of consciousness alone. But, you know, I moved on even from the science of consciousness. I learned early on that conscious or accepted in my practice early on that consciousness is not a product of the brain. It's primordial. It is primordial. It is the substratum of the entire universe. So once we accept that, into our minds, and it's kind of hard for materialist scientists to, to, to try to accept that, right? But once we accept it as primordial, um, boy, things really take off because we've now put consciousness, right, in its proper place. And consciousness, and I'll use the terms God, universe, consciousness, higher self, I'll say all the same thing, right, and operating on energies that we call uh, wave mechanics we call it we can call it kundalini we can call it holy spirit chi okay so these are the things that i've learned since i've uh uh started studying dan winter's science nassim has a similar nassim harrison harim has a, a, you know similar physics but to be able to uh know it's a, it's the it's the knowledge that's coming that 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 is starting to take the mystery, I'm not starting to. That's kind of one of my aims, right? I, is to help to take the mystery, demystify what's going on around us, and to break free of what would appear to be, uh, you know, objects, even just our own uh, body object, and look at it from a, an entirely different perspective, and giving you the self empowerment that we need to uh, uh, establish our own well-being our own mental health and our own physical health through knowing right through knowing what it is that we truly are what is our true nature right our true nature so i wanted to wanted to go through that that's a very important piece uh of, of the of, of the whole picture yeah, good yeah. one thing i want to point out here if, if it's not obvious to people is that um you know, you have a nice balance of experience and understanding. And I think that's really important. Like you said a few minutes ago, that the understanding gave you the sort of conviction to keep going. Understanding can also give a person the motivation to even start. Um, and uh, understanding can also enable a person to realize that they're finished. Although I don't know if there is any such thing as an ultimate finishing, but one can actually be having a high state of enlightenment and not realize it because there's some gap or some doubt in the understanding and that can be cleared up and then that that can completely shift one's whole orientation so you know some people are top heavy on the on the knowledge without much experience and some people are you know em emphasize on the experience side but don't have much understanding about it and either way is a less um assured way of progressing on the on the spiritual path it's much more prone to um downfalls and sidetracks and and stuff like that so if understanding and experience are kept balanced and they they enrich one another they support reinforce one another and it's it's really conducive to um spiritual evolution <laughs> well the what i'd like to say about that rick um i i I guess I was lucky that, fortunate, that I'd always, I've always been pretty single focused yeah. and that I don't get too extracted. I've, you know, start jobs in the corporate world and, you know, get an agenda and go at it. I started my own companies and, 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 and there's, there's just a focus, a goal orientation. 
right? And when I set out to know God, and again, it's right here, all of the, all of the power that we have, all the, all the omniscience, I, if I say, even the inspiration is all here within us. And when we, when we go and declare something, right, for me, I sat, I found, I finally found mine's silent partner. And all I did was, was those meditations. I, I never went to other sources, right? I never scattered my attention, if you will. And the more that I focused my attention on just these specific meditations, right? I call them contemplations. I couldn't meditate that, that energy had risen up into my head. There was no meditating. It was just contemplating. And what I would do is I would take a passage and I was living on a lake and I and I go kayak and 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 just just contemplate this stuff in the shimmering lake water. We'd build bonfires, right? And and I'd just stare into a bonfire for for hours, just contemplating these passages. And I could actually feel shifts in my consciousness, the righteousness as the heart brain coherency was was working. They call it a dual generator. I get the, the dual generator when the heart and brain are working in in total coherence. And if we stick to if we focus our attention inward and stay within without any distractions no tv i didn't no magazines i even with the music i i love classic rock but i put away that playlist and downloaded only uh, electronic music without words because all the songs that i would listen to from the 60s and 70s would would would, would bring up you know, emotions and memories. So I just put all that aside and just move forward with some new, just electronic only music, which by the way, I understand binaural beat kinds of things have an effect on the binaural beats have an effect on, you know, these, all of these vibrations going on. Well, yeah, let me, uh, let me just add that uh, next week, I'm going to be interviewing Eben Alexander and I've been reading his latest book and I didn't know much about binaural beats, but he talks about a lot in that book. And, um, and he also mentions a number of things that you've you've been mentioning. So just for those listening, you might want to catch that one too. Um, binaural beats, in fact, is his seems to be his main spiritual practice. Yeah, yeah he's the guy who yeah. wrote Proof of Heaven, who had a near death experience. He's a neurosurgeon who had a near death experience and was in a coma for a week. And anyway, don't mm-hmm. want to get off on that too much. But okay, keep going. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Where do we want to take this next? Well, I, we I, have a number of things. I mean, I, I read your paper and I took some main points on it, which are interesting. And uh, you also have a six point um, thing, six steps or points that we, we can talk yeah, about. Uh, so yeah. we'll do that. But one thing I just want to sort of loop back on and is the, the, one fo- the one pointedness of your focus. I mean, you just mentioned it, but it's I think that's really important. And uh, it's something that you know, Ramana, Nisargadatta, and others all talked about in terms of, and Papaji all talked about in terms of their own spiritual development. They just kind of like um, grabbed on to spirituality like a, a pit bull on the pant leg of opportunity, to quote George W. Bush, and uh, <laughs> and didn't let go, you know. And it was that one-pointed focus and determination um, yeah, it's that. Yeah, in fact, a yeah, lot of spiritual that, teachers. That inward focus. Yeah, a lot of. I mean, you don't, of, you don't see ahead. you don't see books or TV or music. You know, that, that's nowhere in this graph. Yeah. You know, our attention is focused inward, and and if we can learn to do that, we're going to have very very quick results. Yeah. Yeah. The, so many references to it. A lot of spiritual teachers have said that the desire for God is in itself the most effective means of reaching God. It's the intention. Yeah. Yep. Patanjali in the Yoga Sutras talks about mild, medium, intense, and vehemently intense in terms of one's <laughs> determination, you know. I was vehement. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, a, it's an important, probably the most important variable in terms of the speed with which one yeah. progresses. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, going to the, the, the six points that I make in my paper, mm-hmm. um, setting attention is intention is number two. Yeah. And I only put it as number two because I do think it's very important, number one, for folks to update their science. 
a lot of us our age, even younger, I spoke to a 40-year-old woman, uh, I'm 60, I talked to a 40-year-old woman, and she's still operating, they're still teaching, you know, in high school biology and chemistry uh, and physics, there's no science of consciousness, and in the physics, they really don't get down to the fact that, you know, that, that we're 99.9% .9 non-physical, right? I mean, the kids are just wanting to get through the physics class. That's if they're going into engineering, I guess, right? But physics isn't taught, right, at, at, at the level that it should be, or let's say in the context of your own personal development. Right. So I say number one is update your science. Well, as you know, the materialist oh. paradigm holds that, you know, we live in a material world and the brain creates consciousness. And that's completely, you know, ass backwards in terms of the way yes, the universe yeah, actually works. And in uh, fact, go ahead. Yeah. In fact, um, one of the first things that I did notice during the bliss period, right, as I started to look around, that was one of the first phrases that I said, I'm like, Oh my God, everything is upside down. Everything is upside down. Man has it all backwards. Man does not realize that his consciousness is the one thing he should be paying all of his attention to, right? Uh, at least until he awakens himself. Did you see my interview with Mark Gober? No, sir, I didn't. Uh, I have his book behind me on the shelf there. I couldn't quite reach it without pulling out wires and stuff. But he wrote a book called The, uh, the End to Upside Down Thinking. Okay. And, uh, there you he's go. a young fellow. He was like chairman or captain of the tennis team at Princeton. And then he got to Wall Street and was really successful in that arena. But after a while, he just began to wonder, you know, I don't know, these ideas began to dawn on him. And he just plunged into it and wrote this really good book that's a nice synopsis of evidence that consciousness is fundamental and matter secondary. Yeah. yeah. And I would suggest to anybody who has any doubt about that, just take that plunge, make that assumption and move on to number two. That's kind of what I did. I, I was like, OK, why don't I just make actually the James Porter Mills book, Mind Silent Partner, pretty much established that as a premise. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So and even if a person uh, doesn't feel much orientation to science, I mean, the, the main point about your point number one, which is update your science is gain an understanding, gain a vision of possibilities, that, the, that yeah. the universe, the world is not what it appears to be, and that there's actually something much more profound, and you are capable of achieving it. And once you get that conviction, then you can set about, you know, how, how to achieve it. I mean, I only, you know, I, I, re, I, I read a few of, uh, well, probably all of Greg Braden's books and, and, and Bruce Lipton's and talks about epigenetics and, and, and a couple, a couple books on, I mean, so I didn't, there were no classes. I didn't take any physics classes. It was just a, you know, just a, a very a, a, a general, right, easing into flipping things around, right? So updating your science doesn't require you go back to college, right? Just, just read a few things that are out there. And then, 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 and, and setting your attention. The intention, like you said, uh, is is number one. And and my intention was, again, I'm I was always pretty single focused to begin with. So when I set the intention to know God, know and understand, I'm speaking to myself. When I go out and I state the intention, right? Just because I'm here doesn't mean this stuff isn't here. It's just that I'm just not consciously aware of it. I'm not consciously aware of it. I'm still in fear. I'm still in fear. So it's still there. Your higher self is part of yourself. It's always there. Did you see on my Facebook, I post the dog wagging his tail. Uh, I actually shared that, that to my Facebook. Go ahead. And, uh, <laughs> Or I forget where, what it says. It says, it says the thing that, you've been chasing all along is part of you or something like that. You know, yeah, the thing that you've been chasing, been chasing is chasing its tail. Is right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like it's, it's right here. It's been a part of you all along. But it's it, so it's true. So when you go and declare an intention, right, it, you're not talking to some man on the moon. You're talking to yourself and yourself and yourself knows whether you are 100% emphatic or if there's any level of, uh, uh, of, of doubt, you know, it, it's not going to take you where you want to go or it's going to develop a path for you that is less than a direct path. So if your intention isn't pure, right, 
expect that you probably might be spending a, a, a you know a few more months, a few more lifetimes, you know, how, however much time right it takes <laughs> before your intention is as pure as it could possibly be. You want to know God. You want to. I mean, most people don't. Even scientists, perhaps. Um, you, you want to know your higher self. You want to embody only truth. Perhaps whatever statement it makes, if you are just like I was done with human suffering, not just my own, but many, much suffering that was going on directly around me with my family and friends. Um, yeah, it was, it was, it was pretty clear. There was no doubt, obviously. Yeah. Right. And I would suggest that, you know, you do have to be true to your own nature and tendencies. So a person shouldn't feel like a loser or something if they want to watch television or go to the movies or have a nice meal or, you know, I still play golf. Yeah, you still, play, still play golf. You like <laughs> and, and stuff like that. So um, we don't have to become fanatics. And, and sometimes if a person starts really straining, you know, I, you know, I'm going to get enlightened in a week or bust, then they end up flipping back in the <laughs> other direction. And, you know, that won't happen because this, this life in this, I'll call it higher self, will take you on a path and will have circumstances and things unfold for you at your own pace. It knows everything about you. Yeah. So, you, yeah. That's yeah. A good point. I, uh, it, it does. It knows everything about you. It, it, it's almost like a, your, your entire soul, your entire being from the day you were born is written in these vibrations, right? Yeah. So it knows what's best for you. It there's does. a there's yeah. a saying, I don't know whether it's from the Yoga Sutras or where, but it's the means collect around sattva. And sattva could be interpreted as purity or purity of intention. And like, you know, like you said, you had that intention and then all of a sudden this book shows up. Um, yeah. We had an experience a few years ago where the guy who had been doing our video post-production for many years, very much appreciation to him, um, had done it long enough. And he said, you should really find somebody else um, and somebody who's really into the content, you know. And before he even really put the word out, within a couple of days, um, someone named Angel Mark Lloyd, who had been listening to Back Gap for years, felt the impulse to get in touch with us and say, hey, would you like to somebody to do the video post-production? <laughs> so, oh, wow, well, yeah. So it was perfect. You know, she's been doing a great job. But that's the kind of thing. I mean, that, you know, it was far more than some random coincidence. No such thing as coincidence, Rick. There are certain there are certain words that don't even enter into my vibration anymore. I'll say One right, my vocabulary. Yeah. yeah, no, no such thing as coincidence. And you know, I'll even go so far. We'll talk about this in just a second. You know, disease does not enter my consciousness anymore. It it it, it, it does not exist for me in my consciousness. Uh, do I experience some things? Yes, but. We'll talk about this at the end because I'd like to wrap this up with what we call self-healing. Okay, good. Okay. Good. Right, Before right. we get into whatever we're going to do next, let me intersect a couple of questions that came in. One is from Claire in Birmingham, England, and uh, hi, Claire. She's she said I'm going to actually ask her a question and then I'm going to embellish it a bit. She said I missed the start. Did you mention the name of the work you based your exploration on? That was the Mills guy, right? James Porter Mills okay. Minds. Silent partner. Mind silent yes. partner. I can even link to that from your bat gap page. Yeah. And then um, her second part is, what does it mean to be told one has an active kundalini? And I'd like to add to her question by saying, what if a person feels they don't have an active kundalini? And what, what you know, I have an idea what kundalini is, but I don't seem to be having any kundalini experiences. What's wrong with me? I mean, what would you say to that kind of person? Well, that's interesting. It's one of the uh, topics of discussions that I've, I've had uh, a little bit with Emerging Sciences Foundation. Uh, one of the, I think is a myth, that this kundalini energy uh, stays dormant at the base of our spine until it decides to rise. I'm like, I, I, I'm probably going to call that perhaps something we need to probably look into and maybe drop that as something as a belief. Well, I mean, Kundalini is, is a, is a, I feel right. I've studied it enough. I've experienced it enough is, is our life energy. How is it staying dormant in the base of our body when in, in essence, right? It really is the energies that are all around us, right? 
at all times. So yeah, but like the little guy would, on the left that you know hasn't the, the fear guy. I mean, obviously his energies. He's still alive. He's alive, but his energies are dormant. So his light is being hid under a bushel, so to speak. Well, I kind of, like I said, I'd, I'd, I'd been talking to emerging scientists and some other uh, 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 people about this, that if it's our life energy, um, I, it may just be stuck. For me, stuck, yeah. it was stuck in my, in, in my, my third chakra, uh, my third, you know, third area here, manifesting as heart palpitations. Uh, I think as we, as, we, as we mature, as we age from an infant, that energy is maybe in that root chakra. And as we go about, uh, you know, adolescence is rising up into the second chakra as we uh, uh, develop these external relationships and work relationships and expand our, you know, relationships outside of ourselves to other people, other things, right? It's in our third chakra area. So I, I just, I just kind of wonder this notion that we have that it's stuck in our root chakra area all this time until it decides to rise. What's keeping us alive? What's beating my heart? Yeah. Right. I think that, yeah. um, yeah, I think that someone like Bonnie Greenwell or Joan Harrigan or somebody would have a good answer for that. And I wouldn't be able to answer it as well as they, but I, I think that they yeah. would acknowledge that, yeah, this energy, it's not like it's totally locked down and nothing trickles yeah. upward, but, you know, people go through their whole lives without having it really blossom to the extent that it could in all the higher chakras. Uh, I don't. I don't know. Again, I you know I studied the, the Kundalini for for a while uh, for that year, that first year after the three years of bliss, and I had to go back to my original practice and look at that quite seriously as you know what i was trying to do was regenerate my consciousness which boom took that energy all the way up through my crown chakra uh, uh, you know eventually yeah, but that doesn't happen so. to most people it happened to you because you're really cooking you know and you had this uh, intense desire and doing staring at the wall for six hours at a time but most people just go through life without anything like that happening perhaps then we need to be looking at this kundalini as a very very powerful energy i call it life energy yeah. again i'm trying to demystify it that it is our and through it we can evolve ourselves evolve our consciousness and if we don't know this if we don't know this perhaps it is going to get stuck in one of the lower chakras perfect right? i and think that's what there. every yeah. all the people have been saying all these yeah. gen, you know yeah. millennia um, yeah, everyone says it's there. I mean, kingdom of heaven is within you and all the yogis and everybody else says, yes, you have this tremendous latent untapped source of power that lies within whatever, however they describe mm -hmm. it. But the point is to tap it. And most the vast majority of humanity doesn't really do that significantly. And hopefully we're in a time now where it's proliferating more and more. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We're getting yeah. out and to uh, Some, something in the atmosphere, so to speak. <laughs> it's it's everywhere yeah. right uh hopefully to again demystify mm -hmm. it and yeah. take a lot of the lore out of it i mean you can really really get stuck i think if you uh consider to, to the not consider but continue to believe that this is some mysterious what do you call it feminine the, the goddess energy yeah with forms I mean, immediately or whatever turn, yeah we yeah, need to bring science into it yeah, that'll, that'll, that, I mean, my husband doesn't want to get feminine. He's like, I, I you know, <laughs> as a construction guy. <laughs> right, right. So, I mean, it'll it just our perception of what this beautiful life energy is. I think it, it in, in is a very big stumbling block. Yeah. So it's it's time to. No, bring that's that, a very that, good point. That, that drama. Very good point, yeah. and that's true of not only Kundalini but all aspects of spirituality and consciousness and everything else. I think it would be tremendously important and it's happening more and more and more for a marriage of science and spirituality to take place in which each enriches the other and believe me both of them have tremendous value to offer the other and i think you know i don't know when but sooner or later we're we won't see a dichotomy between them we'll have a sort of a 
body of knowledge and experience that incorporates the best of them both, and both will have evolved significantly because of that interaction. Well, I like to say that, you know, uh, in, in the beginning and even at the end of the little video that I made, the, the clip is, there's a link of it in that paper that you'll post that link. And in the, in, in the video, uh, which I made uh, about a year ago, I say, I'm here to help bridge the gap between science and spirituality. If I were to restate that right now, I would say there is no bridge between here and here. There is no bridge. We are it. We are all that is. We are sovereign beings. Yep. We are sovereign beings. So you just have to realize it. Yeah. Uh, this is a good time to ask this question that came in from Jan uh, Ringelstein in, in Germany. I, I can relate very much to Lisa's experience and have had something similar. I think it would be very benef very important for people like us to talk to each other and share our feelings, maybe using Zoom or Skype meetings. Are there any groups who are doing this, or how do you find like-minded people? Thanks, Rick. You're this. <laughs> yeah, I'm it. <laughs> Tag you, <That's>... Rick. <laughs> and there is a uh, there is a Bat Gap Facebook group where people get into all kinds of conversations about such things. I don't know how many members we have now. I think over eleven thousand or something. Um, so there's that. But you know, she she brings up a good point. People could organize something like that. I mean, somebody could post in that Facebook book group, "Hey, let's have a Zoom meeting with each other," and, uh, and that somebody could just organize it and have it. And the, go ahead. What are you saying? Just feel free to friend me, and and you know we'll strike up conversation. I I'm I'm very open now. This is my first interview that I've done uh -huh. officially. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've had several conversations, but this is the first one officially. So let's let's run with it. Sure. I call it the shareable wave right now, right? And so. there are conferences, like you mentioned, the Emerging Sciences Foundation, and then there's the Galileo Commission, and uh, a bunch of and there's like the Shift Network, and a bunch of things where people and the Science and Non Duality Conference. So people do have these Zoom things, but there's usually in most of those not a lot of opportunity for everyone to share and speak and interact. Sure. So. You know, but informally, it wouldn't be too hard to set something like that up. Nope. Nope. Yeah. Wouldn't have to cost to anything or anything. The, yeah, you want to finish up the, the six points? Yes. Uh, or do you have another question? Hang on one second. <laughs> I mean, just sent me a joke about our dog. Yes, go ahead and finish up the six <laughs> points. <laughs> Is it that dog with the wagging tail? Was that your dog uh, in, that, in that Facebook no, post? No, <laughs> but we, we have a dog that's... Uh, the, one of my, you mentioned you liked some group that's something puppy. Uh, oh, the sick, sick puppy. Uh, there's sorry. a group I really like called <laughs> Snarky Puppy. So we mm -hmm. have a group, a dog that's kind of like a snarky puppy, and like he's he's a, a chewini. He's called. He's a, he can get really snarky, and so um, <laughs> Irene, his name is Theo, and I. Send that I know I'm going to read it anyway. The, Irene says <laughs> Theo says he ha he has a kundamini. <laughs> Kundamini. Kundamini. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's get serious. Let's go back to our points. Right. We got to stay focused if we're ever going to. No, I, I kind of like that humor. That's good. Um, yeah, so setting the intention, mm -hmm. yep. right? And for me, it was very emphatic. Uh, number three, then uh, claim your true identity. This is a very, very big piece. Claim your true identity. You're not the individual with your relationships in the world and your work you know you know how it is the the mother the brother the sister the 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 the, the, the manager of the company or whatever none these are very worldly things right but your true identity which perhaps we have yet to claim right is we are omniscient being I, at least it worked for me at first it was i am divine love i am divine peace and began to see myself in a different light altogether, what is the light of consciousness, right? I began to see myself in a different light altogether. And again, experiencing some beautiful physiological changes within my body, just by recognizing myself as the divine peace and love of God, right? Oh my God. And then when I began to identify instead with even uh, more intense uh, uh, frequencies, I'll say, um, my omniscience, right, infinite and eternal nature, when you sit with that for a while, and it doesn't take a long time before a an identity uh, starts to 
rise up within you that virtually leaves you with left me with the uh, the feeling that heck I'm I'm a universal being with unlimited potential. I, you know, there's nothing can stop me from being able to do what I desire to do. There's nothing outside of myself, right, that is any more important than uh, who and what I am from a from an infinite and and in, in eternal perspective, and. So that's why I say, uh, claim it. You must claim it. And remember, you've got all this higher self all around you. It hears you. And when you go out and claim yourself as infinite and eternal, guess what? You're going to match up with these very cosmic wave mechanics that are going to come in, very intelligent, all-knowing, all-powerful wave mechanics that will enter into your conscious aura, right, and begin to do its works if you will, on your consciousness, raising your consciousness. Remember, and I say it in the paper, you're not, and Ramana says this, other spirituals you say it as well, you're not the one doing the work here. When a woman gets pregnant, she's not making the baby. She's watching TV and cooking dinner. The baby is being made by the creator, right? Likewise, all I had to do was claim my identity, set my attention, claim my identity, and the work is being done for you. There's nothing that we have to do. Let me ask you a couple questions yeah. on that. One is with regard to identity. Would it be true to say that, you know, you might say, well, I'll pretend I'm you. Well, I, you know, I'm Lisa and I live in Colorado and I like to play golf and I like to go fly fishing and I like to hike. And, you know, those are some things about my life. But those are just the tip of the iceberg. Those are just one little wave. And, you know, what I really am ultimately is this ocean. Uh, and yet, you know, it's not, it's not to say I'm not a wave. I am a wave, but I'm more fundamentally an ocean. And both are true. Would, it, would that be a fair way of describing it? How about we do this? The I am is a pure statement of being that is infinite and eternal and unchanging. And I am divine love. I am uh, the peace of God. I am the universe. I like to golf, right? I have family. I love my relationships, but I am is the purest statement of being, right? It's a declaration of your true identity, your true nature. So, so yeah. how about if we think of it this way? We're, we're sense organs of the infinite. We're, sent, we're organs of action of the infinite. And the infinite enjoys playing a little golf through this particular sense organ. Uh, yeah. <laughs> he likes skiing through that sense organ, or he or she. <laughs> I got in trouble the other week for referring to the infinite in a masculine no. gender. Um, somebody from Berkeley exactly. gave me hell on it. <laughs> no, it was uh, Alan Watts, right, who would call us the apertures. Yeah. We are the apertures of the the one infinite creator. Right. right? And if you this little sense organs. <laughs> right, and if you think about the whole universe, all the galaxies and stars and all the beings who live on all those galaxies and so on, they're all they're just the infinite variety of sense organs of the one universal being all the all the forms that we see all the objects that we see we are one conscious being being conscious right and we are not this separate self ricky you've heard all this right yeah but it's nice to articulate we are not it. this yes yeah, so we're not this separate self Right. Um, I, I am, if I go around saying I am Lisa, I am a wife, I am, a, I'll never get to my true nature. Yeah. Right. And the I am statement of being, which actually is, there's a beautiful 10 page, 10 pages of mind's silent partner, from J Dr. James Porter Mills, that speaks very eloquently uh, to the I am statement of being. And the, and when you're using that, you are really waking up. Let's go back to this picture. When you say I am, these little guys out here, right, are taking notice. That's the I am. I heard a great story yeah. the other night from Swami Sarvapriyananda. Um, he was talking about Swami Shivananda, I believe it was. He was a disciple of, of Swami Vivekananda, who was a disciple of 
Sri Ramakrishna. And anyway, um, he had some serious health problems. He had asthma and stuff, and sometimes he couldn't sleep because he couldn't breathe if he went to sleep. And so one night he was I was awake most of the night. He was very uncomfortable. And in the morning, one of his disciples said, How are you doing, sir? And he said, Oh, I'm great. I'm marvelous. And, and the disciple said, Oh, but we heard that you were really suffering and you were awake all night. And he, and he said, Oh, you mean my body? Yeah, that's in bad shape. <laughs> <laughs> it was a bad night for my body. <laughs> I've, had, I've had many of those. I've had many of those. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So... Um, before okay, we go on to the four. next point, let me just slip in a little um, question here that came in, because I'd like to get them in. Yes, uh, this is from Melissa in Brisbane, Australia. I'm getting people all over the hey, world Melissa. today. Um, has your diet changed since this profound spiritual experience? And if so, how? And, and does it contribute to expansion of consciousness? My diet has not changed. Um, I still drink beer when I play golf. I still eat meat. Uh, I, uh, I, I, there were a couple things that I, I, I do more of. I drink a heck of a lot more water, mainly because I think I moved to Colorado. Yeah, you need it. But in remember, the w w yeah, what what we're dealing with here is not our physical nature. What we call our physical nature. What we're dealing with here is of a mental nature, uh, uh, mind, consciousness. Uh, uh, wave mechanics, and uh, even Raman Maharshi will say this. I, I, I you know, n no, we do not have to. We really do not have to. It helps a lot to for us physically to feel better, so that perhaps a meditative or uh, contemplative session might go more comfortably. Uh, I honestly, um, if you're drinking three glasses of wine a night, you're probably going to go to sleep, you know, before any effects of meditation take place. So, you know, you, I think once again, um, check within, right? You'll know, you, you, you'll know. And, uh, but I know, thanks for the question. I didn't do anything at all to al alter uh, my diet at all. Okay, good. And if you ever are supposed to, I imagine you'll be inclined to, and you probably don't have to worry about it too much. It'll happen if it happens. <clears throat> oh, I get messages. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so before we go off of point three, claim your true identity, um, you know, people have been listening to us, and, and I'm sure that most people, for most people, these concepts are not new, that, you know, you're, you have this oceanic right. consciousness and being, and that's who you really are, and all that stuff. Um, so for someone listening who doesn't really experience that, but they just understand it intellectually, how exactly did they claim it, and what difference will claiming it make? I guess because it became so evident to me after when when I read those in this in the be beginning of the book, uh, James Porter Mills's book, Mind Silent Partner. It became so clear to me that the I am statement of being, right, is. Uh, a crucial, a critical piece that we have to break the mind free, right, from our old concept of ourselves, right? So, Rick, if you wanted to become a concert pianist, right, and start taking, you know, piano lessons, you, pro you might get there a lot quicker if you, in your mind, and this is not just affirmation that's going on, right? But if in your mind you accept yourself as a concert pianist, guess what's going to happen? You're probably going to get there a lot quicker, right? Instead of fumbling through lessons and going to teachers, you just emphatically declare yourself as I am, just like Tiger Woods did. I will be the number one golfer. I am the number one golfer in the world. So sure. it's, you're not gonna it's just, a very, uh, very powerful statement. You're not yeah. just going to end up. There was, um, I think it was um, Horowitz. Someone uh, came up to him in on the street in New York City and said, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? And he said, practice, practice, practice. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would say to, and, and this is where the uh, uh, Ramana's self-inquiry uh, practice comes from. And we'd call it self-inquiry. He uses the question, who am I? What it does is it turns the mind right back on itself. There's no outward projection. Every time you have a thought, you know, a thought about anything out in the outer world, the, the self-inquiry practice, who am I, brings your attention right back to center. I am. 
Who am I? I am. That's why that practice is so very powerful. Yeah. I am. We're not, we're not even meditating on an object out there, right? That's the difference between meditation and self-inquiry. You just, and that's really what I was doing when I was establishing myself as I am omniscient, infinite, eternal, right? So it's, it was the same practice as self-inquiry, right? And my mind is not out there even meditating on anything in the objective in the objective world. So I I learned of the power of it through the Mind Silent Partner pamphlet. I bought into it and did it, and it seemed to really accelerate uh, my my attention and my focus. And there's a lot of physics with regards to uh, the power of attention. And what is happening to us, piezoelectrically, I think is the word, okay? There's a lot of physics behind our power of attention. In fact, in every single now moment, and you know this, we only ever have the now moment. There's the past and the future, right? But we only ever have in this now moment. And in this now moment, where is your attention? Because that's all you have. Really, in this now moment, where is your attention? here or like 99% of the population <laughs> right everywhere else but yeah. here. you want you want to awaken quickly establish your true identity the i am right and and keep your attention focused inward and watch what happens watch all that beautiful high powered highly intelligent knowledgeable uh energy that's around us start to flow through you very 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 quickly yep. there's a great verse in the gita it goes um for many branched and endlessly diverse are the intellects of the irresolute but the resolute intellect is one pointed and yeah they, yeah there you go <laughs> just think, let thine eye be single yep. right let thine eye and their whole body will be full of light and then, of yeah. course, there's Nisargadatta who said, my guru told me that I am the self, I am pure being, and I believed him, and I just stuck to that conviction, and within about three years, he, he fully realized it. Yep, 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 beautiful. All right. Yeah, beautiful. So let's go on to point four. Okay, surrender. Big, big one for me. And again, it goes back to the, the some of the kundalini symptoms that that uh, we spoke about earlier, especially with the, uh, the one question. Um, uh, the, especially for me, uh, I, I knew nothing about the inner world. I knew nothing about the inner world. I, my, my attention was uh, entirely in, uh, you know, with the objective world. And so I had a lot of, a lot of blockages. And so when I began the, the practices, um, the the energy was surfacing in, in certain ways. And if if there's any resistance whatsoever, if I didn't if I didn't come across the uh, art of surrender, um, and actually, believe it or not, <laughs> when I when I came to know myself as the peace and love of God through Regina Don Aker's New Testament interpretation, I also latched on to she had also um, written this little pamphlet called uh, The Teachings of, of Inner Ramana. She too, she just embraced Ramana Maharshi's teachings, read through them. They're very kind of difficult. A uh, lot of Sanskrit terminology, a lot of Hindu terminology, but through contemplation um, and a lot of help from Ramana type energy, right? She ended up scribing, she calls it scribing, Right, the uh, the teachings of inner Ramana, and in it she breaks down what is self inquiry, so that the Western mind can understand really what is self inquiry, as well as, and this is cute, what is surrender. And so I, I read the pamphlet, and I'm like, okay. So I typed, I, I ripped out. Look at this. I ripped out page eleven or whatever the page is, six and seven. What is what is surrender? <laughs> right? Carried it around what your is pocket. Surrender? It, it, I carried it around my pocket for for months. I think you need to have it laminated. I, it's it's classic, isn't it? It's just classic. But in here, she lists then at different points. You know what we can do. What do we mean by surrender, right? And different things that we can do in every single moment, right? Because uh, I was really incapable of doing self inquiry. Uh, but in every single moment, 
how am I to see this? So if something is happening out there, like an argument, how am I to see that? Let the, let the, let the higher self, let the, let the, let, let it be perceived in a different perspective, right? Um, how shall I listen to this, right? How shall I, uh, some of the, and I'm sorry, I'm reading through the ripped paper here, right? But uh, how should I think? So what you're doing is you're observing, you become more the observer of events and circumstances going on around you. And instead of reacting, right, you, and you don't just walk away, what you're doing is you're asking your higher self, these higher beautiful energies that are right here at our disposal, how should I, how should I, how should I be viewing this? What should I take from this? Instead of responding, we're being the observer, right? And letting the higher self then answer the question for us internally, we can walk away. I mean, we don't have to then jump into the argument and say, well, my higher self said, no. The, the whole practice is, is to begin to train the mind, right? To instead of, in, instead of reacting to the external world, that we keep our mind focused, that we're keeping our mind focused. And the art of surrender, especially uh, when we're dealing with some physiological or uh, even psychological psychic kinds of things that are happening due to this beautiful energy that's just trying to just trying to break through right um, uh, it, it really helps when you're what I call fully surrendered and every single day I would wake up and surrender myself to God to render surrender I was fully surrendered to the spirit of God as James Porter Mills would say what you want to do is get rid of your human race consciousness. It's very limited, right? And rambling and rustling and what do they call it? That uh, monkey mind thing, right? Right. And instead, fill it right with the spirit of life, the type of consciousness that we were meant to and designed to house a divine consciousness, right? So I was already pretty much surrendered to what I call the spirit of life, L I F E with a capital L, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's yeah. That's surrender. It's it's a it's a, it's it's a good one, and you can practice it all the time in every single moment. Right? Yeah, and it doesn't mean you become passive and you somehow just wait. Oh no, I never become. You know, passive. I mean, some people might think, <laughs> well, I'm just going to sit here until I the spirit moves me to do something like get a job or, or get out of bed or whatever. What you're doing, what you're doing, is you're evolving your consciousness. You're not responding to the same old story. You know, that the, the same argument, the same situation, the same election, the same stuff, you know, you're not responding to it. What's more important? What, what is what is lasting and eternal, right? Your consciousness, you're evolving your consciousness. I, I'd like to spend 24 hours a day evolving my consciousness. Yeah. yeah. Another yeah. way I look at it is that, and you've said this today, is that you know, if everything is divine, if everything is, is intelligence, if the whole creation is this play and display of, of intelligence, then, you know, surrender to an extent means being observant and being kind of cooperative with the play as it unfolds itself, you know, being sensitive to what is unfolding and responding accordingly. Well, it's amazing too, Rick, once you're not participatory in things that no longer serve you, they will fall away. They will fall away because you are no longer of that, that vibration. So either those people in your life are going to fall away. If they're family members, they become more peaceful. We, we are all one conscious being. So I, you know, I bring my attention inward. I'm much more peaceful, a heck of a lot less, you know, uh, belligerent, let's say, in, in response to external situations, family kinds of stuff going on. The whole family's become kind of peaceful. And it's, it, it's we're one conscious being. Yeah. And yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> nice. Mm -hmm. I'll just quickly throw in a Gita verse for that one, too. That it's... Um... The objects of sense turn away from him who does not feed upon them, but the taste for them persists. On seeing, oh, on seeing the supreme, even this taste vanishes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. It's it's uh, 
it's the it's the universe at work through all of us. And when one of us when one of us chooses the highest and best good, guess what's going to happen? The universe is going to allow for that as opposed to anything else that might be going on in that particular circumstance or situation. Eventually, it may not happen right yeah, away. Good point, though. Highest you know. first. Um, okay, point five. Uh, what are we meditate. talking here? Oh, meditate. I use the word meditate because a lot of folks know that versus uh, I, I use contemplation, right? Uh, but uh, it is important to, to, I think, establish a meditative practice and not for purpose other than to evolve your consciousness in this case. This is what I was trying to do. I was trying to regenerate my consciousness. So I knew that a practice to continue to keep my attention focused inward was essential. Anything less than my total attention inward was less than my total attention inward. So a meditative practice, anything that I could do, right, to keep my attention focused inward. Um, there are all kinds of meditative practices, as you well know, Rick, right, just to establish peace of mind, to establish, let's say, just focus your awareness on awareness. Beautiful. That helps to really settle the mind, right, and helps to I think, bring into your conscious being some higher frequencies, some higher lovely, more cosmic frequencies into your aura. Some people meditate purely for, um, you know, those spiritual experiences, right? Of uh, being able to um, have glorious, colorful, very uh, uh, what do you say, densely conscious kind of spiritual experiences right behind their closed eyes. Uh, so meditation serves many, many purposes. Uh, but I was, I, I had established a, a, a meditation practice. I, it was, it was um, contemplation, right? Contemplation, where I would take a passage and a very inspiring packet, passage and contemplate it for hours. Just one passage contemplate for hours and um, you're evolving your consciousness. And so I found that by what, what else did I say here? Your intent here is to uh, evolve your consciousness, attain liberation. Such meditations are self dynamizing. I learned that from Aurobindo. If you go to the uh, Aurobindo website, talking about how self dynamizing they are, they are evolving your consciousness. We're not just playing around or trying to become peaceful. We are evolving our consciousness and will align your consciousness with universal principles. And that's and that's and that's what I was doing. Uh, and I gave a couple of examples in the in the paper here of, of some of the most powerful um, uh, contemplative uh, things that that I would take to heart. And 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 uh, but again, it all comes back down to the level of attention that you're giving to your to your inner world. Yeah. Right. And one thing about meditation is that your motivation for doing it may evolve over time. I taught meditation for many years and sometimes people would start because they had high blood pressure or because, you know, they couldn't sleep well or because they wanted to have a better golf game. You may remember the book Golf in the Kingdom by Michael Murphy. <laughs> um, yeah. But, you know, then you'd see them six months later and they, they'd say, and you say, how's the blood pressure doing or the insomnia? And they say, oh, that's OK. But now I'm kind of interested in this cosmic consciousness stuff, you know. <laughs> so the yeah. motivation may yeah. change. So it's kind of, in a way, doesn't matter why you why you start. Uh, well, you have your higher self's attention. That's for sure. That's why it does evolve. Yeah, yeah. You know, some people they start with yoga, thinking, you know, they're just getting some some muscular movement. But tell you what, what you're doing is you're settling your energy down. You're centering your energy, and guess what starts rising right into your consciousness is the higher is the higher consciousness. So all of a sudden they find themselves meditating and, and wanting to do more and yeah. more, you know. So. A question came in relevant to what we're talking about right now from Rob in Newburyport, Massachusetts. Um, hey, Rob. Could Lisa elaborate more on her approach to contemplation? I have a practice of meditation, but I'm dealing with physical suffering that sometimes makes it difficult. So learning more yeah. about how Lisa <laughs> used contemplation would be great. Well, I, I did speak to that uh, uh, earlier. Find something, Rob, uh, highly inspir uh, inspirational, meaning it, it uh, 
has um, for me it was it was uh, abstract concepts um, as abstract that would um, help to in in enlighten and keep my and keep my questioning going on for instance now i'll go ahead and read the example that i gave in my paper it's just a very short example right uh one of uh, mills's james porter mills's from the mind silent partner one of my favorites was come forth come now forth thou living word light the offices of my mind my spirit is thy spirit a wellspring of truth rising up is eternal life within me now have a sip of wine and think on that while staring into a bonfire. Just a sip. And just say a sip. It, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just say it over and over and over again in your in your mind and contemplate. Let the mind. I would I would do it open eyed. I found myself staring at walls a lot, right? Uh, bonfires and 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 shimmering lake water, even clouds in the sky. As I continued to contemplate such beautiful, inspirational kinds of words, remember when we use words of truth, such as eternal life, right, or omniscience, or uh, divine love, the, the 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 spirit of these words will rise up in your consciousness. You can't help but to just sit there and want to contemplate more and more. So I would say just find something that works for you that's highly inspirational, inspirited from spirit, right? That really keeps your mind, uh, you know, from going back out into the, uh, the, the outer world. Keeps it keeps it focused within. And I think something that works for you is the key phrase, and different things work for different people. So if yes. something doesn't work for you, find something that does, something will work. Yeah. 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 All yeah. right. Point six, abide. Yeah, <laughs> I got that from Ramana. So, <laughs> so I mentioned to you, I'd never studied any of Ramana's material, right? Uh, even after um, uh, taking the eight week, the, the six week course, day eight into it, where I Toss his book aside because I, I couldn't I couldn't understand a sta Sanskrit word that was being said. I I didn't understand what he was saying at all. And even after the six weeks, I'm like, you know, I'm a, you know I might get back to that. But I did I did really embrace in the three year period. Even though I I stayed inside, I stayed inside myself. I didn't research the internet what happened to me at all. But I I did feel comfortable going and and researching uh, Ram some of Ramana's material and. Uh, uh, conscious immortality. Conscious immortality was one of my favorites. Um, beautiful stuff in conscious mortality for me, me to continue to contemplate. Is that a, a particular uh, book or something, or is that just a, one of the concepts? That might be a book, but I think it was no. It was it was a like I, I think I have it in PDF. Oh, there, so there's a document called Conscious Immortality. Yes, Conscious Immortality. From Ramana? And uh, yeah, okay. uh -huh. uh, yes, um, it was probably as you well know. Um, excerpted uh, from something well excerpted and somebody wrote it uh -huh. for him right and then was re, re uh was translated into english mm. i forget it was back in that three-year period of bliss but uh one of the most uh uh um one of, one of the other things that i got kind of attached to there's a, a fellow on facebook john wassenberg and he'll post little blurbs little sound bites from ramana's all of his stuff he has letters uh uh, gems, um, you know, conscious immortality, all kinds of documents. And John Lossenberg will post these beautiful little gems, right, of, of Ramana. So I allowed myself to, to, uh, to expand my learning of Ramana's teachings of, uh, outside of self-inquiry and outside of surrender. And that's where I picked up on the term abidance. And when 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 we look at abidance, it just means to persevere. You may get distracted. Uh, yeah, I got distracted. In fact, um, right before the experience, um, I, I Rick, I, I used to own a boat rental business, right? For fifteen years, a fleet of boats and jet skis, a houseboat, and you know, here I am trying to. 
uh, and and I closed the business down. But I was I was uh, I am a boater. I, uh, but but back then on the lake, a, a very big boater. And and uh, I, I I swear for 15 years I never had a problem with with boats being in and around boats. But darned if I didn't slip off my boat and mangle both of my legs right below the knee to where I was rendered I couldn't I I couldn't do anything but <laughs> but. But lay in bed. I was miserable, absolutely miserable. That's when I signed up for that class because I was like, yeah, I, I couldn't go anywhere uh, at all. So I'm just going to go ahead and sign up for that class because I was pretty much committed by this time to give it 24-7, right? 24-7. I had gotten to that point. Well, why not? I, I can't walk, right? And why does that happen? You know, how is it? Is that higher self sometimes, that universe, right, that is playing with you? It's like, how do I fall off of a boat? I ran a business for 15 years, right? Reminds me of Ajashanti's experience. He was like a, a competitive bicycle racer. And, and you know, at a certain, and he started getting into spirituality. And at a certain point, he found himself flat in bed for a month, six months or something like that. And it was some strange thing. And he eventually recovered for it and from it. And he started getting better. He started getting back into bicycle racing. And then, boom, he's back in bed. And finally, he got the <laughs> message. And Yeah, it is the message. And I've come to learn that about sickness and, and illness and injury. I'm glad you're bringing that up because you said you wanted to talk about health. And we're, we're kind of at the end of our time almost. So let's segue into that now. What, what you okay. wanted to say All about right. that. <clears throat> okay, um, I appreciate that. So um, the, um, the regeneration process, right, that, that I grasped and held on to, uh, and they call it the Kundalini awakening, spiritual awakening. I called it, I regenerated my consciousness back to this, back to truth, back to the state it is that we are all born with, right, in, in the world, pure pure consciousness and without any conditioning uh, whatsoever. And uh, uh, what, what I'm learning, and I use the word regeneration, right, um, in, uh, is that there is a whole arena of, of regenerative healing, a whole uh, uh, pr uh, discipline. And I actually have hooked up with a fella by the name of uh, Ken Graydon. Ken Graydon. And the title of the book is too small to put on the camera, right? Regeneration Healing, uh, Self-Healing. Regeneration Healing. And it has to do with being able to, uh, uh, and I think this is what I did with regenerating my consciousness. Consciousness is omnipresent. What happened yesterday, what is happening in the future, is accessible now. If you think about, if you studied the science of consciousness enough, you know that it is omnipresent, meaning we can go back into the future, right, and bring it forward, like I believe is really what was happening when I went to go regenerate my consciousness. It regenerated, right, the consciousness back to its the the truth premise that it was when when I was born. Um, so likewise, I am working now uh, with with Ken uh, and and a group. He has a Facebook group to try to understand more about this and to be able to self heal. Now that I understand, I think the omnipresence of consciousness and being able to affect in the now moment conditions that I may have experienced in the past, right? They called the, what, the Akashic Records, right? There is a record of every moment of your life, every moment of yourself somewhere here, <laughs> where my, I, I don't know where I'm pointing <laughs> to, right? But the whole idea of being able to self-heal is a, uh, it comes from uh, the omnipresent nature, of our consciousness, so it's a new it's a new area for me, and I'm really really looking forward to it. And if there's one more thing I can say about it, Rick, is that I truly believe, I truly honestly believe uh, that the pineal gland, okay, which 
opened up for me during during the uh, during the during the experience is a critical absolutely critical more so than the pituitary gland the, the the pineal gland is the master gland it is the gland right that enables and allow for and, and allows for our healing and self and and, and well-being with that with the pineal gland obstructed in any way shape or form i think we we see this is why we see illness in in the world there was a uh, uh, i belong to the academy for a uh, academy for the advancement of post materialist scientists yeah you've probably interviewed a number of them uh, uh, marjorie willcott oh, yeah marjorie's Dean great Ray. yeah yeah, Dean, Dean, Dean Raid and uh, others. Charles Schwartz, Charles Tart, or whatever, yep. and that, uh, some some of those fellows. Uh, Menace, Menace, Menace Capatos, yes, 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 gorgeous, right? So I joined their group as an affiliate member, and they just recently posted uh, something, and I thought, oh my gosh, what in time? How you know how does that work with the universe? Right, throws out a post, right, uh, for the scientific basis for integrative medicine. Integrative medicine being, of course, the whole mind-body uh, uh, organism and the integration of it and how essential. This article was posted, or this book was written in 2005, 15 years ago, called The Scientific Basis of Integrative Medicine. The There was an article then that summarized the book, posted on the National Institute of Health uh, website that speaks to the importance of the pineal gland and its and its and its master control over our whole immune system. So I say, I say again, going back to one of one of my purposes to demystify this whole beautiful life energy. I, you know, why aren't we setting up master classes to open up our pineal glands? Let's do this thing. There's no fear. There's so much mythology and fear. If the pineal gland is so critically important for health and well-being, as per something that's 15 years old, let's let's get on it. Let's let's do that. Yeah, there's there's a lot of things we need to get on, and I th I think it's picking up momentum. There's you know more and more people and groups like the ones you've mentioned who are just getting on this thing, and and uh, you know I think that. Um, the future is potentially very bright because of that upwelling of, of interest in such things. And, and you don't yeah. see it on the six o'clock news. So it can be rather depressing to, to <laughs> see what people think is going on, which is going on, but yeah. there's so much more going on that doesn't get reported. I think there's fears there that are unfounded that, you know, you're going to open up some psychic abilities that you don't want. No, once again, your higher self, which is right here, right? knows when your time is ready for whatever it is, right, that you're supposed to be doing, whatever your sole purpose is. And, you know, I have explored psychic abilities. Nothing's come to me. It, you know, I've explored lucid dreaming. I've explored astral projection. I've explored these things and have, have attempted to remote view, right, or even just see with my eyes closed. You know, there are kids nowadays that are born that are able to see with their eyes closed. I know. I've, I've read right? some new, stuff new like that. Yeah, it's fascinating stuff. Yeah. Huh. Fascinating. Interesting. So that's where I'm headed. Yeah, I'm, that's where I'm headed after. I, I wanted to do this interview with you, Rick. I, again, um, very much inspired by uh, not only all the work that you've done over the past years. God bless. I, I you know, I can't say an, enough about Buddha at the gas pump, but but because I was inspired by by your interview with with Dean and saying if there's any way anybody can step forward with some science to try to help out, right, to bridge this gap that I, it's just one, you know, it's just one, there is no bridge, we're, it's just, it's, we're all, we are one, we are all one. Yeah. Well, that's a good note to end on. And there's, there's so much more. I mean, you and I could easily go on for another couple of hours, but uh, we've given people a taste and um, I'll put up a page on BatGap you know, as I always do about this interview. And perhaps you could send me links to like some of these books that you've held up because uh, people might okay. want to know what they are and I can link to them from that page. And okay. um, if you want people to get in, be able to get in touch with you, how should they do that? Through Facebook? Yeah, or? just Facebook. All right, yep. through Facebook. Yep, Facebook. So I'll put a link to yep. your Facebook page on there. 
Okay. And I'll All put right. up that paper that you've been talking about, and which you know goes into some more detail about the things we've been talking about. So yeah. great. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, and I and I really appreciate everybody who's tuned in live today. I I really do. That makes me feel wonderful. Yeah, we've had right? quite a few people. That, it's up uh, to like drew, 260 or 250 or 60 people the whole time. Good. Yeah. Good. Thank good. you, everybody. Thank you so much, and thank you, Rick and Irene. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Lisa. So. Um, and thanks to those who've been listening or watching. And as I mentioned earlier, next week will be Eben Alexander and also his partner, Karen Newell. And uh, the week after that, Richard Tarnas, who's a cosmologist at the California Institute of Integral Studies. And it rolls along. All right. So thank yeah. you, everybody. And we'll see you for the next one. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you.